ஆர்ட்டிபிஷியல்ஸ்ரிஃபிகேஷன் <laughs> so breast cancer uh, is become one of the uh, most common uh, cancers in women in india uh, according to statistics it was cs cervix but in the last decade so statistics from 2012 suggest that breast cancer is the most common uh, cancer in women in india so hence that is why this is a topic of uh, uh, interest and most important topic for um, surgery so uh, if we start with the uh, carcinoma breast okay see in the last class we have discussed in during the last um, few minutes that it all revolves on the concept of the basement membrane if this is the basement membrane and you have the epithelial cells over here this is called as the basal epithelium which lies on the basement membrane now this uh, there could be hyperplasia of these cells associated with atp the atypical features would be uh, increase in the mitotic figures or um, um the loss of polarity of the nuclei pleomorphism so these are all the features which will uh, convert the cells into the malignant version so there could be hyperplasia like this with atp as long as the basement membrane is intact okay this is still called as carcinoma in situ carcinoma in situ now once there is going to be breach in this membrane the basal membrane now the tumor cells are going to spill out so these cells will come into the uh, let's say the lymphovascular system and there is going to be metastasis so now the disease is called as the invasive carcinoma so the understanding of these two terms is extremely important uh in understanding the uh, pathology as well as the management of ca breast okay so i hope this is understood moving on okay uh so first is uh, we are going to uh, see the classification the pathological classification pathological classification of um ca breast or rather the malignant lesions of the breast so first we have what is called as the pre malignant lesions pre malignant lesions so this is uh, just the hyperplasia with atp as we have already discussed hi- uh, hyperplasia is increase in the number of cells atp are the uh, changes in the nuclear as well as the cellular um, morphology which is will be suggestive of a malignant change okay so it is hyperplasia with atp now the second one is the carcinoma in situ carcinoma in situ so here we have seen that there is going to be hyperplasia with atp and basement membrane uh, basement membrane is intact now here uh, it's a range actually it's a wide range uh, you cannot really say uh histologically as to where the hyperplasia and atp will end and where the carcinoma in situ will begin so uh, there is no clear cut point over there this is just the progression of the disease so after this when there is invasion or breach in the base membrane it becomes an invasive carcinoma so in carcinoma in situ we have two types that is ductal carcinoma in situ and the lobular carcinoma in situ so these are the headings under which we will discuss and then invasive carcinoma is further divided into one it is invasive ductal carcinoma then invasive lobular carcinoma and the inflammatory type inflammatory breast cancer or ibc so these are the short forms which we will be using during the class so dcis stands for ductal carcinoma in situ lobular carcinoma in situ is lcis and invasive carcinoma we have the invasive ductal carcinoma invasive lobular carcinoma 
and inflammatory breast cancer. So this is the pathological classification. There are other uh, like subtypes in this which we will discuss as and when it is uh, encountered. Okay. So now first we will discuss about the in situ variety that is the uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. So the DCIS is the most common type of carcinoma in situ. Okay, so here uh, first we will see what happens at the molecular level, then we will see the clinical presentation, then the imaging findings and how we manage this condition. See the incidence of uh, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ has increased majorly because of the mammographic screening. So the screening program has um, uh, been is it's being done more commonly nowadays in India as well as abroad. So the rate at which we pick up the early disease is increased. So hence the incidence overall has been increased. Uh, the DCIS, let's say, normally uh, presents as a lump. Okay, it could be, uh, there could be an impalpable uh, breast, it could be completely normal during screening, you might see some radiologic abnormality, and then you will uh, do um, the tissue studies and then you'll find out it is DC DCS. That could be one of the ways. But more commonly, in an Indian setup, uh, you will uh, find a, a lady who, is, who comes to you with a lump, okay, and then uh, which will be usually painless. And then uh, when you do let's say the triple assessment so we have just discussed this in the previous class it's called the triple assessment the components of triple assessment for quick revision are first is the clinical examination followed by the imaging studies most commonly it will be the mammographic study it's a mammography which is the x-ray of the breast and finally we are going to have the tissue study which could be fnac or a true cut biopsy now, uh, why is DCIS so important? Because we know very logically that this is uh, a kind of a precursor for an invasive cancer that is going to be the invasive ductal carcinoma. So this is a precursor. So hence, we need to find this out at an early stage. And it will normally take five years, okay, if untreated, for a DCIS to turn into an invasive ductal cancer. The five years is the latent period. So you need to uh, kind of screen and get these, identify these patients in the invasive state and then um, treat them before they land up in an invasive ductal cancer. Now, as we said, uh, clinically, there could be a palpable mass or there could not be a mass. And uh, then once they undergo the mammographic screening or uh, let's say the investigation, once they have a lump, you're going to see microscopic microscopic calcification, which is characteristic. Uh, so as we said, it is ductal carcinoma. We have seen the anatomy of the breast. So we have the collecting, uh, what do you call the lactiferous ducts actually with the sinuses, and then they are going to end up in the lobules. So this is the terminal lobular unit. So this tumor normally arises from the duct system somewhere over here. So this is how it is. So that is the location of it. Now, if we take the, if we look at the microscopic picture of the ducts, if this is, let's say, the lumen of the duct, the tumor cells are going to proliferate over here because it's in situ, remember, the epithelium, the basal membrane, the basement membrane is intact and the cells are going to occupy the space. Now it's going to grow to such an extent that it will, uh, what do you call, outrun the amount of um, blood supply that is uh, available. So the cells are proliferating at a higher rate, but they fall short of the blood supply. So the center of this lumen will undergo necrosis and then it will form this kind of necrosis over here. This is called as uh, the comedo type, the comedo necrosis. And this uh, type of the uh, ductal carcinoma in situ is associated with the worst prognosis. And another subtype of the DCIS happens to be when there are multiple, you know, um, kind of loculi 
uh, which are present in the duct. So this is all the extra proliferated cells over here. So this is called as the cribriform type. So this is also known as the Swiss uh, cheese appearance. Swiss cheese appearance. So these are the um, types, histological types of DCIS. And what we've just learned is that comedonecrosis is associated with worst prognosis. So this happens to be the classification of DCIS. So now let's say a patient came with uh, a lump and then we have done the imaging. We have seen some kind of calcification, microcalcification, and then uh, it is a suspicious lesion. And uh, now uh, we have done an FNAC, okay? Or rather true cut biopsy is more specific because we have studied again, the differences between FNAC and true cut. What are the advantages of true cut over FNAC? Okay, so in true cut, we are going to take a chunk of the tissue and hence we can tell whether it is carcinoma in situ or invasive. So let's say we have got the diagnosis as carcinoma in situ. Now what will be our next step? So now we cannot leave the patient as it is because DCIS is a precursor to invasive carcinoma. We know that it will take over five years. So you don't know where the, when the patient has come to you. Correct, so she will eventually develop the invasive type. So what you should do one, you could do wide local excision. So now we're talking about the management. Okay. So management of DCIS. So here, if the lump is small, okay, then we can, all we can do is, if this is a breast, let's, this is a nipple areola complex, there is a, a small lump somewhere here palpable. So you can remove it, okay? Keep two centimeter margin. And you can remove this, okay? And if it is big, then it will end up becoming a mastectomy. So don't hesitate if the uh, DCIS is uh, extensive, then you can go ahead and do uh, mastectomy. Then go for adjuvant radiotherapy if it comes out to be high grade variety. Now let's see. It so happens that you think it is DCIS. You have done the excision of the lump, lumpectomy with the margin, or you have done a mastectomy, whatever it is. And then you find out that there is already areas where there is invasive ductal carcinoma. It's possible. For such cases, you will have to follow it up with radiotherapy. Radiotherapy. Again, if the tumor is big, and you think it is high grade, uh, as in your uh, tissue studies have told it's high grade, then you might have to go ahead and do a sentinel, senti sentinel lymph node biopsy as well. See, because you don't know, there might be uh, an invasive carcinoma which is housing in that lesion. So you will have to go ahead and treat it like a normal invasive breast cancer. You need to do radiotherapy. You need to go ahead with the axillary lymph node clearance. Okay. And um, also, uh, newer studies have suggested that the use of SERM, okay, which is selective estrogen receptor modulators, the drug happens to be tamoxifen, Use of tamoxifen in patients with DCS, that to the premenopausal women, that is women less than 50 years, has shown significant reduction in the risk of recurrence. So this is precursor, right? This is um, a precursor to an invasive condition. There could be recurrence of this condition again. So by the use of the drug tamoxifen, we can reduce the risk of recurrence by half, around 40 to 50 percent in women who are less than 50 years. So this is the important um, aspect of management of DCIS. Just remember, you can go for a wide local excision. If the tumor is too big, treat it like a normal carcinoma. Go ahead with mastectomy, high grade with incidental finding of uh, invasive cancer already. Then go ahead with ra uh, radiotherapy following the, um, ex uh, the mastectomy. And then go ahead and do the axillary clearance and uh, also, if the patient happens to be young, you can start her on tamoxifen. Now, this finishes the DCIS. Hope that was clear. Now, moving on to the LCIS. LCIS is lobular carcinoma. Uh, may, I may I interrupt you, Dr. Sonika? Uh, sure. It was an 
it it was a nice thing actually what uh, what we do in a practical scenario is yes, if sir. there is uh, any lump palpable lump or any yes. suspicious lesion picked up by any radiological investigation mm -hmm. what we do is if there is palpable lump we can straight away go ahead with the um look at biopsy and at the same sitting you can also do uh, the whether it is invasive carcinoma or in situ carcinoma and also you can pick up the her2 new status mm -hmm. and erpr receptor status also from the true cut biopsy itself suppose if it is positive or if the history is strongly suggestive if any first degree relatives or second degree relatives are there suffering from carcinoma invasive carcinoma breast or both from both maternal and paternal sides then you can there is no contraindication to do uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy and go ahead with the axillary clearance followed by radiotherapy as well as chemotherapy uh, so actually the requirement of the chemotherapy is also guided by certain thing so nowadays what is the approach is it is not so much conservative approach so the excision of tissue might be a slightly on a conservative approach but uh, radiotherapy and chemotherapy we go very aggressively and any suspicious suppose if the margin turns out to be positive we keep on excising and can do quadrantectomy and then we can go ahead with the uh, both hormonal as well as chemo and radiotherapy so you can be aggressive in that aspect this is practically i don't know whether you are taking a class in mcq point of view or for a post graduate so this is the approach nowadays please go ahead thank you thank you so much ma'am thank you for adding the valuable points so uh, okay now continuing with uh, lcis which is lobular carcinoma in situ so the uh, term itself is a misnomer as we don't consider this as a malignancy but rather as a marker of an increased risk of breast cancer in bilateral breast so i think i must put that down so it is a misnomer it is actually taken as a marker of increased risk rather than the tumor itself so increased risk of ca breast bilaterally so fine so this lcis is uh, again uh, different from dcs in a way that usually the tu uh, the growth here whatever the tumor is it is not palpable most of the times and uh, and most of the times it also remains radiologically occult as in we don't see any calcifications or any typical features on the mammogram and uh, they happen to be multifocal and bilateral so hence it makes lcs picking up lcs more difficult rather it will be an incidental finding on the uh, histology so let me put that down so one is that it will it is not associated with a lump so you don't see any clinically detectable or palpable lump two uh, it will be radiologically occult radiologically occult most of the times three in 50% of cases it will be multifocal and bilateral now there are some important statistics associated with lcis that is to be noted that is let's say there is lcis which is radiologically detected so there are some radiological signs which are present then that means this is associated with 30% increase in the risk of development of development of a synchronous ca breast so before we uh, begin here i'll just make the term synchronous and metachronous very clear synchronous meaning when uh, uh, the tumor is detected uh, the uh, new mass that is the tumor is detected within le less than or within 6 months of detecting the primary so you have already already identified the primary you are seeing another lump in a time duration which is less than 6 months after identifying the primary then that lesion will be the synchronous lesion while a uh, metachronous lesion is something that is seen more than 6 months of detecting the primary the term is metachronous 
Okay. So that means there is, if the radiological sign is present, it, there is 30% increase in the risk of development of a synchronous breast, uh, CA breast. The second option was if there are no radiological features. So there is no radiological feature suggestive of any um, malignant breast lesion, then that means there is still 30% increase in the risk of developing a metachronous lesion. 30% increase in the risk of developing a metachronous CA breast. So it is more than six months that we have dis uh, discussed, but here the time period, the late, the lag phase is somewhere about 15 years. So there's a pretty uh, long uh, lag period for the development of uh, the um, lesion. And in this, when we say there's increased risk, it is 20% increased risk of developing invasive carcinoma in the ipsilateral ipsilateral breast and 15% increase in the risk of developing an invasive carcinoma in the contralateral breast. So these numbers are pretty important. It just tells us how important uh, it is as a pre-malignant lesion. And then the fact that it can be bilateral uh, it is very, very important. And if LCIS becomes invasive carcinoma, uh, it will be ductal, invasive ductal carcinoma more commoner than the invasive lobular. So this is another point to be noted that in this develops into carcinoma, it is going to be an invasive ductal type more than the invasive lobular carcinoma. So now with this, we will see the management of the LCIS. Uh, as we have just said that it is a marker of malignancy rather than malignancy itself. The major thing we do is the observation. So coming to the management, if the patient is young, okay, then all we are going to do is we are going to keep screening her regularly, starting from the age of 35 years. On a yearly basis, we are going to screen the patient. Uh, but if the patient is older, there's no point in screening. You could, uh, with additional family history if present, then you can go with risk-reducing mastectomy. So with some family history, because they'll be more prone. So they're at a higher risk. So you can just go for a risk-reducing mastectomy. We will uh, see the risk reducing techniques in a while once we uh, discuss the genetic factors uh, associated with CA breast. So uh, hence younger patient, you just keep screening them. If you see any suspicious lesion, then you could go ahead with the mastectomy. If they're older with family history, then you can directly go ahead and do the bilateral mastectomy. That is the risk reducing mastectomy. Okay, so now next we will discuss about the invasive ductal carcinoma. We have finished DCIS and uh, LCIS. Now we'll go ahead and discuss about the invasive ductal carcinoma. Now we know that most of the invasive cancers happen to be the ductal type. Around less than 10% are the invasive lobular type. And there are again subtypes of the invasive ductal carcinoma based on the histology. Just a brief mention of that. First is the non-specific type, okay, or the not otherwise specified. NOS stands for not otherwise specified. That means all the different types of cells, histological types are present, scattered uh, in this. So this is, it forms around 80% of the um, uh, uh, the IDs, IDC basically. This is the most common type. And then following this is the medullary ductal carcinoma, medullary type ductal carcinoma. This usually does not present as a lump. It will be like a spongy mass. Like when you palpate it, it will palpate more like a cystic disease than um, a lump, a hard lump. So here you will get a spongy, spongy breast. And this is associated with overall good prognosis. So this is having 
good prognosis. And then is the mucinous type. It's called as the mucinous ductal carcinoma. See, the, it's very logical. If it's mucinous ductal carcinoma, that means the cells are producing mucin. That is, that means they're mature enough. That means they're differentiated. So again, mucinous ductal cells are rare, but they're associated with good prognosis because they're differentiated cells. And uh, next variety is the papillary ductal carcinoma. So under the microscope, you see if this is a duct, the cells, uh, the tumor looks like finger-like projections. That's why the name papillary. And uh, though they are papillary, like they do not, uh, or they rarely invade the um, basal basement membrane and then become invasive. So hence, the papillary variety uh, of IDC is most commonly treated like a DCIS because it rarely invades. Uh, so. Uh, this is this variety is again pretty rare variety of uh, IDC. Next is the last one is the tubular variety, the tubular uh, ductal carcinoma. Again, under the microscope, you're going to see multiple tubular structures. This is seen in uh, women uh, who are usually more than 50 years and they are ER positive, ER status, that is estrogen receptor positive. So this is more than 50 years with ER positive status. So these were the uh, important highlights under uh, each and every category of IDC. Uh, when, when we normally talk about CA breast, in general, we are talking about the invasive ductal variety. Then a little word about the invasive lobular carcinoma. Uh, the, there are two uh, typical histological pictures uh, that will be asked pretty often. So we have the Indian file pattern of cells. So the malignant cells will stack themselves up like this. So this is called as the Indian file pattern. And there's another pattern where again the tumor cells are going to adhere to each other like that around an acini. So this, at the center, you have a glandular structure, which is the acini, and these are the tumor cells around it. So this is called as the bullseye appearance. So these are the two typical appearances on histology. And again, uh, we know that it constitutes uh, the lesser proportion of the invasive carcinomas, that is around 10% of all the breast cancers. And uh, very rarely they present with a discrete lump, otherwise they do not uh, come with a lump. And also they will remain mammographically occult there as compared to the ductal carcinoma. And uh, they, uh, the ILC, that is the invasive lobular carcinoma, is associated with higher incidence of bilateral breast cancer. Very important. Okay, they are associated with increased risk of bilateral uh, CA breast. So the contralateral breast is involved either synchronously or metachronously. So when it is bilateral, so the primary will be in one breast, the contralateral breast is involved synchronously in around 3% of patients and metachronously in up to 30% of patients. That means at some time or the other, the contralateral breast will be involved. Either it is less than 6 months or more than 6 months. So that's why they tend to be bilateral. Okay. So... Uh, and then lastly, a word about the inflammatory variety. So this uh, type of uh, breast cancer is having the worst prognosis. Uh, as the word suggests inflammatory, it has all the signs of inflammation. Uh, as in there is uh, due to the involvement of the dermal uh, lymphatics and the skin. So there is going to be edema, uh, rubber that is edema and uh, there will be local rise of temperature. So it becomes very difficult to differentiate this from cellulitis of the breast, as we have discussed in the last class. And uh, they're associated with the worst prognosis. Uh, you'll have to give them uh, chemotherapy, kind of reduce the inflammation, reduce the, um, uh, the severity of the disease first, and then consider for a uh, mastectomy with axillary clearance. So that's about the inflammatory variety. Uh, now let's just discuss about the risk factors, uh, which are uh, very commonly tested upon uh, during the exams. So risk factors for CA breast. 
uh, first one happens to be the age sex very important uh, uh, greater the age increases the uh, incidence of the breast cancer and uh, regarding the sex male breast cancers if they are present will prompt the genetic uh, studies so we'll have to go in for the an genetic analysis uh, of the patient as well as his family members so that's the importance of uh, age and sex and next is basically the estrogen exposure greater the estrogen estrogen ex exposure they'll have increased risk of the uh, uh, ca breast so first one is the early menarche early menarche then um, the late menopause not having children that is nulliparity then um, the age at the first child age of the female or the lady at her first child this is important uh, because see the what happens in all of these conditions is that uh, more the um, menstrual cycles the lady has been exposed to more is the estrogen in her body so that is the um, predisposing factor for development of ca breast and then uh, estrogens could be supplemented as well like uh, we talk about ocps and hrt we have made one point clear in the previous class that ocps have uh, the uh, the dose of estrogen progesterone is very very low in these ocps so hence uh, they are not a risk factor for ca breast but while hrt is because there is a, a, a slightly higher amount of estrogen in this compared to the ocps which will form a risk factor and that to hrt for more than 5 years will show the um, you know, what do you call uh, increased risk that is only after 5 years of continuous hrt uh, after this uh, we spoke about the lifestyle which is important that is a uh, higher socio economic status uh obese obese females uh then smoking is not actually but alcohol alcohol consumption is and we have made a point regarding smoking smoking is not a risk factor smoking is not a risk factor for development of ca breast and there are two more very uh, uh fond uh, questions um the, that is one is like smoking is protective in which conditions smoking is protective rather very funny but yes these are the kind of questions they might ask that is one is parkinsons and the other one is crohn's so these are the two conditions where smoking is found protective so this could be asked in your viva or for your entrance as well um okay coming back to the risk factors again um after this the family history is very very important the family history so and the genetic uh, component see uh, what is important is that most of the times the ca breast happens to be sporadic but 5% of the ca breast is uh, associated with the autosomal dominant variety of inheritance of certain genes which i will mention right now so it is brca1 and brca2 as well as the gene that is p53 gene so these three are um, uh, the genes which are commonly associated with ca breast so we need to compare and contrast braca1 and braca2 okay first is the location of the genes so uh, breca1 is located on chromosome number 17 the long arm and uh, breca2 is present on chromosome number 13 long arm again now breca1 is associated with cancers like ca breast ca ovary ca colon and ca prostate tumor that the breca2 is associated with is ca breast and one thing is important is that it is ca breast which is commonly associated in females this is ca breast in males as well as females this is important 
So how can you remember it? Ladies first, BRCA1, which is seen in females, and two, which is seen in both males and females. Along with CA breast, you can have, uh, you also have CA ovary uh, as well as uh, CA pancreas. So I'm just writing only the important points over here. So uh, after that, uh, it is these BRCA1 tumors, they uh, happen to be more aggressive. Aggressive, they are bigger, defined, um, and aggressive. While the BRCA2, this one, they, these tumors, with, they tend to have better prognosis compared to uh, the BRCA1 tumors. And again, stats over here, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer in a BRCA1 carrier is 70%. So if someone is carrier, the penetrance, this is what I'm talking about is penetrance. It's a feature of an autosomal dominant disorder. Okay, so it is 70% in BRCA1 and here it is around 55% in BRCA2. So this is regarding the penetrance. That means you're carrying the gene, the mutated gene. What are the chances that you develop the disease? Now, the lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer in BRCA1. So I'll take a different color for this. For the ovarian cancer, the risk is 30 to 60% in BRCA1. In BRCA2, it is 10 to 30%. So these stats are important. And uh, mutation carriers, let's say they have developed CA breast, either C BRCA1 or 2, they have developed CA breast, then the chances of having contralateral CA breast is up to 50%. It could be either either one of these, but the risk will increase by 50%. Okay. Fine. So further on, now let's say a patient uh, has family history. Now, you, uh, while you're taking the history. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, one more addition to yes, this sir. is between BRCA1 and 2. The why it is why BRCA1 carries bad prognosis and BRCA2 has good prognosis is mm -hmm. the presence of ERPR receptors and uh, the absence of HER2 new receptors. As you all know, presence of ERPR receptors is a good prognostic factor because you have a one more weapon to combat the carcinoma breast. Whereas presence of HER2 new receptors is a bad prognostic factor. In BRCA2 carriers, there will be high ERPR positivity rate and less number of HER2 new receptors. That's why BRCA2 has got better prognosis. And also male carcinoma breast has got better prognosis compared to the BRCA1 positive uh, female counterpart. So that is also one of the important factors. Okay. Thank you. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Huh. So now, uh, while, when we take uh, family history, now if there is significant family history, then the patient should be referred to a genetics clinic and they must undergo the gene testing. So what is the criteria? Now, if uh, there is a female who has come to you with a CA breast and then you ask the following question, if, if or if any one of these is positive, then you will have to refer her to the um, genetic clinic. So first one is that there are two, okay, I'll just write in black. Okay, two first degree or second degree relatives who have been diagnosed with CA breast before the age of 50. Again, if, if this is, if this criteria is present, you just refer them to if there are three first degree or second degree relatives with CA breast before the age of 60 years. Again, you have to refer them or any four, basically four relatives with CA breast at any age. At any age. Then you will have to refer them.
Now, if there is a patient with ovarian cancer, let's say this is with CA breast, someone has come with CA relative who is diagnosed with CA breast before the age of 50. This could be the patient who is having CA ovary. So along with CA ovary, if she also has CA breast, she can be included in this case. additional relative who is diagnosed with ovarian cancer at any age. Again, one more lady with CA ovary at any age will also prompt genetic investigation. And finally, there are two first degree or second degree relatives who are diagnosed with CA breast before the age of 60 years. Okay, so uh, this is, it might seem a little confusing, but if you just jot it down, write it down, and then you go through this, it will make sense. So this will be the criteria for referring to the genetic claiming. So apart from BRCA1 and 2, we have just seen that there is a gene called P53, and mutation in this gene is known as the leaf romani syndrome. So it's a gene P53. So basically BRCA1 and 2. So these are the DNA mismatch repair genes. So basically if there's a damage in the DNA, these uh, genes will um, correct them and prevent the malignancy uh, or the uh, malignant changes basically. So P53 happens to be a, the um, the anti-oncogenic gene. So if there is a mutation in this, again, it will predispose the patient to develop the uh, tumor. Now, this is present on chromosome number 17 again. So these are the important things. Other syndromes like Pugh Jaggers and Cowden syndrome uh, may also be associated with CA breast. Now, the other risk factors uh, we have already mentioned, uh, but Two things that I left out regarding the risk factors is, one is the radiation exposure. If there is a child who has had radiation exposure during the childhood, let's say for Hodgkin's lymphoma, just a radiation, then it is a, a, a risk factor. And uh, there is a surprising study which, just, uh, which showed that um, night shift workers basically uh, have decreased amount of mel uh, uh, the melatonin uh, hormone, which is associated with increased risk of CA breast. This is a pretty surprising uh, finding, actually. So this happens to be the overall uh, uh, this one information regarding the risk factors. Okay, so now um, regarding the. Uh, risk reduction mastectomy that we just mentioned or the risk reduction techniques which we just mentioned. So first one is the bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. So for this, uh, uh, we're going to do the bilateral mastectomy. It is going to reduce the risk of CA breast by 95%. 95% reduction, but you might say why there is still the 5% chance. It's because of the skin and the nipple that has been left behind that could uh, result in uh, the recurrence. And two, we'll also have, but see, uh, the mastectomy will not have any impact or reduction of risk for CA ovary. It will remain the same. So along with this bilateral prophylactic mastectomy, we'll have to go for a bilateral salphingo oophorectomy as in the removal of the ovaries. This will reduce the risk of getting the ovarian cancer by 90%. So this reduction is for CA breast. So this reduction is for CA ovaries. It is 90% reduction. Again, there is 10% uh, risk. It is because of the development of carcinoma in the stump. That is the fallopian stump. Then uh, the bilateral salphingo ophorectomy will reduce the risk of CA breast by 50%. While bilateral mastectomy did not reduce the risk of CA ovary, but removing the bilateral ovary will reduce the risk of CA breast by 50%. 
So this is pretty important. Again, along with the risk reduction techniques that is mastectomy, oophorectomy, we can also start the patient on chemoprophylaxis, which happens to be with the drug tamoxifen again. Tamoxifen. Okay, now the patient uh, has come to us. We have uh, done the triple assessment. We have now the diagnosis. The next step is staging of the, uh, the patient. So we need to know what stage does the patient belong to, and then we will move on to the management. So the staging, we, are, we, will, we will talk about the uh, TNM staging. Uh, we, we will take it up in the next class because it might be time consuming. The TNM staging along with the, the uh, category, the staging, basically A, B, 2, A, B, 3, A, B, C, and the stage 4. So we will discuss that in a while. But before we actually close it up, uh, I want to just talk about the molecular subtypes. Uh, Ma'am just mentioned about the ERPR status. I'll just quickly highlight that. See, ER stands for estrogen receptor, PR stands for progesterone receptor, and there's something called HER2 nu. Basically, this is human uh, epithelial receptor 2. So, um, as we know, that steroid receptors or the steroid hormones, they usually have the receptors on the nucleus. So, this is basic physiology. Our thyroid hormone, our steroid hormones, the receptors are present on the nucleus, but her 2 new is an epithelial, it's a cell membrane uh, receptor. So the receptor is present on the cell membrane. So now when uh, I have just mentioned uh, in the previous class that we take cells and then we are going to do the immunohistochemistry. The purpose of immunohistochemistry is to find out the ERPR her 2 new status. So now if there is presence of ERPR, that means the tumor is mature enough that it is differentiated enough to have estrogen and progesterone receptors. And her 2 new is actually a bad indicator because uh, increased her 2 new will predict or will show that the tumor is highly proliferating. So increased her 2 new is a bad indicator. Now what we do is when we take the tissue and study the tissue for these th three receptors, we're going to add certain dyes and the receptors will take up the dye. So here, it's actually brown in color. I'll just make it red. So here, if this is the cell, the nucleus is going to take up the dye. This is how it's going to appear. And then if more than 1% of your cells are, are taking up the color, this tumor, the nucleus is going to take up the color, then you give the report as positive. You're going to say ERPR positive. And for her to new, there is a grading which goes like this, 0, 1 plus, 2 plus and 3 plus. If it is 0 and 1 plus, okay, it is going to be negative. It is scored as negative. If it is 2 plus, that means it is equivocal. That means you will have to go for an amplification. The number of receptors you have, it's not really clear to say whether it's positive or negative. That means you'll have to go for uh, amplification that is called as fish fluoroscopic in situ hybridization where you're going to increase the number of receptors again and you're going to see it. Then you'll uh, conclude if it is positive or negative. Now, if it is 3 plus, it is clear cut her to new positive. Now, based on this, the ERPR status, we have the molecular classification. We have the molecular classification of CA based. So, first one is called the luminal type A. Luminal A, then we have luminal B, then we have the basal type, and finally, we have the her 2 new enriched. This is not really a type, but um, we can, can like include it here and remember, enriched type. So, here we are going to talk about the ER, PR, and her two new. There's also something called as the KI67, which is again an indicator of rapid proliferation. So let's fill up this table. So luminal A is ER, PR positive, and her two new negative, and with a low KI67 value. That means, yeah, it's differentiated, but it's not proliferating too much. That means this is good. So this is associated with the best prognosis. 
So the next one that is luminal B, that means the here it is ER, PR positive along with HER2 new positive. All three are positive. It can be associated with a low KI67 value or it could be high. So this is of intermediate prognosis. Now coming to the basal variety, the basal variety is another name that is called as the triple negative. As in all the three are negative. So this is associated with the worst prognosis as we can say. It is worst prognosis. This is usually seen in the African American women and here again the incidence of metastasis is high, the visceral metastasis because it's having worst prognosis so it will go for an invasive disease and metastasis so hence they'll have the worst prognosis. And there's something called as the triple negative breast cancer paradox that means they respond very well to chemotherapy initially but later on the tumor will relapse because of the spread. It has already involved the lymphovascular uh, structures so there's high chances of relapse and the, but the tumor will respond very well to chemotherapy initially. And the last one is the HER2 new enriched that means ERPR negative, but HER2 new is positive. Again, this is also associated with bad prognosis, but we have a drug for this. The, uh, the, the drug is called Herceptin. Uh, so also known as Transtuzumab, we must be knowing that. Transtuzumab. Now this is going to go and block the receptor and uh, pre uh, prevent the proliferation. So this uh, molecular classification is important. If we go through this again, luminal A is ERPR positive, HER2 negative, good prognosis. Luminal B is all positive, basal is all negative. You can just remember it like this. Now the further staging and stage-wise management of CA breast uh, will be dealt in the next class. Ma'am, do you want to add anything? Uh, uh, actually, we can use Herceptin for luminal B also because uh, it it is going to block the HER2 new receptors and it is also ERPR positive. So that's why it has got a certain intermediate prognosis and the rate of relapse is also a bit low in case of uh, luminal B. And one more uh, explanation of risk factors with the uh, first degree relatives is if uh, it depends, if, uh, if suppose if two scenarios are there, a patient comes with her mother giving history of carcinoma breast, then sister coming with uh, carcinoma breast, so which is more dangerous? So it is the sister, person whose sister is, uh, has received uh, treatment for carcinoma breast or having carcinoma breast because the gene has already penetrated to the next generation. So you should be more vigilant and the screening should start at least by 10 years prior, if there is any sister giving history of carcinoma breast. So these are the points I wanted to ask. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the students? I assume there are no questions. No questions means either you have understood very well or uh, nothing has gone inside. <laughs> she has told very nicely and at least one interactive thing would be a nice gesture. Okay, ma'am, then we'll call it a day. Um, thank you for attending the class. Okay, I think we've got one comment here. Uh, one more question, Mr. Dr. Amar Khajapur has put. Uh, usually the male breast carcinoma are more aggressive, but here BRCA1 is having bad prognosis. See, one problem with male carcinoma breast is there is hardly any amount of breast tissue there and there is absent lobular pattern. So what happens is the male breast carcinoma, though it takes longer time to become invasive, 
once it becomes invasive it proliferates very rapidly because there is hardly any tissue so the chance of getting attached uh, to the chest wall or the skin is the duration is very shorter because in female breast there is some stromal tissue for the cells to proliferate and become a malignant so female breast carcinoma has got uh, it has got some time for its multiplication and uh, for the infiltration into the stroma it takes slightly longer time but the good factor if diagnosed earlier in case of male breast carcinoma it has got good prognosis because 80% of the male breast cancers are positive for brca2 so they are more prone for hormonal therapy so once if you diagnose them at an earlier stage before chest wall involvement they are more uh, uh, help it is it will be more helpful if they are given hormonal therapy the overall prognosis remains good in male carcinoma breast whereas if you detect male carcinoma breast in advanced stages then the prognosis will become worse well put ma'am actually any more questions Okay then. Thank you for attending the class. Uh, let's cover the further topics in the upcoming classes. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Ma'am.